Hi, it's Matthew Reed here with another Reed Repairs video. Now this one is going to be quite a deep dive. The object, which is a, a clock, um, was quite complicated in its repair and so we decided to split that up into multiple videos that you'll see over the forthcoming months. But I wanted to take this opportunity really uh, to have a mini launch for this channel. The channel has been on the go with one video for the past 18 months or so. And that one video has really encouraged us to do more. So many thanks to all of you who have liked and subscribed. Where possible, we've uh, responded to your feedback as well. So please keep the comments coming uh, below. So the Read Repairs channel is going to be primarily horological. So mostly clocks and clock type objects, the occasional watch maybe, but more importantly for us, we want to really widen the scope to begin to address uh, other objects that are not from this kind of primary discipline of ours. So please keep an eye open for them. Right to repair is really important to us. Obviously the whole point about if you repair something, uh, the sustainability of that as a process, as a social function, and really also very important, the fact that uh, repair and making uh, can be really great for well-being and sustaining communities. So uh, again, we hope you like the content. Some of it is quite uh, in-depth, uh, other is going to be sort of more general. So as always, uh, thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already, and we will see you again soon. So here we have an 18th century three train uh, spring clock in an ebonized case and it came to me um, not working. So the first thing I do is take a few record shots, sort of general uh, shots of the case and so on, just to record what's there, what isn't there and uh, what the overall kind of condition is. Once I've done that, I label the parts such as winding keys, case keys and so on. In order to remove the movement from the case, we take out these two uh, case bracket screws and then unscrew the case brackets from the movement. Now you can see that the movement looks very clean, which is an indication that the clock has been uh, worked on recently, which tells us a little bit more about the kind of approach that we're going to take in finding out what we think is uh, causing the problem. And the first thing I see is that the hand retaining washer, or collet as uh, we call it, has got some lead solder or soft solder on the back. Now this is quite unusual, it doesn't particularly matter in terms of its performance as such, but what it does tell me is that there's likely to be another issue further inside the clock and this has been added to try and overcome that issue. Now we'd already uh, taken the dial off um, in the presence of the client to kind of um, discuss a way forward which is why these pins are quite loose. So the back of the hour hand there had the usual marks where it had been tightened up to fit on its square. We remove the pins from the dial and then we can lift the dial away. The dial here isn't causing us any problems so I'll just photograph it and pack it uh, for storage while we're doing work on the clock. So um, this clock has got three uh, what we call trains, so three separate gearboxes. So we'll just remove the bell and its nut and get that out of the way. Now this clock um, is quarter striking, so it strikes every 15 minutes on 
eight bells that you can see on the right there and strikes the hours on the hour on the single bell that we've just removed. Now I noted that the hour striking train is a little bit maybe on the slow side so it'll be interesting to see what that mainspring is like. But otherwise here are the three trains striking on the left here, quarter striking on the right and then going train in the middle. And the um, these uh, levers that I'm pointing to, they connect those three mechanisms. They count out the quarters, count out the hours, and uh, allow the striking to be uh, released at the correct moment, and so on. The clock has what we call flirt striking. So uh, this is striking without warning. This weight here that you can see me pointing to, and this spring, release the striking exactly on the quarter or on the hour and my initial impression is that much of the or many of the issues with this clock are actually coming from this part of the mechanism the quarter striking now you might think that if the clock stops that's something to do with the time or going train but in fact um, it can also be to do with the quarter striking train or the hour striking train or in fact all three because as you see they're connected. So I spend quite a lot of time uh, running through this striking sequence looking for components that are tight, looking for components that are loose as in one, looking for relatively recent uh, alterations which are always a sign of somewhere to look more closely. Uh, here I'm just moving up to the hour and checking the operation of the our striking counting device which seems to be working okay and the hour striking train being released um, but I noticed that the quarter striking in particular it has uh, what appears to be a little weight added to um, the one component called the rack hook and weights added to the fly which is pretty unusual and something that we'll have to investigate as we go along. Yeah, in fact when I release the quarter striking train and just hold the fly back it can in fact stall which is um, uh, really leading me again towards that area of the mechanism needing further inquiry. Also, when the quarter striking train stops or locks, um, normally what you'd expect is for some of that energy, kinetic energy, to be dissipated by the action of the fly or that air brake that we can see at the top of the movement frame. But that's not happening here. The, the train is kind of bouncing as it locks, which is uh, not good. I think, again, that is sort of pointing me in that direction. You can hear that the hour striking hammer uh, sounds a bit loose and the hammer shank is bent round, it's curved round, um, which are not ideal maybe, but they're relatively easy, um, easy gains in a kind of overall approach to a repair. We can see that this component here is loose uh, because it's either worn or it has a new pipe. And when we look at this, component which is the quarter snail so the device that counts how many quarters the clock is going to strike here we're in uh, a mode called safety um, but there's a lot of pressure on this quarter cam if for any reason the quarter striking train doesn't run here again we can see that loose component and this device the quarter rack hook latch is heavily sprung now this clock has got several springs in the work that fits between the movement front plate and the dial and they have to be finely balanced. We've got other things there like the hour pipe has been held in the jaws of a vice at some point but that's kind of normal for a clock that's been around 200 years. Yeah this uh, I think needs attention to start with. The spring blade is later 
and it's oversprung. And all that energy to, um, to deflect that component has to come out of the quarter striking train. So if you can get the, uh, the force of these springs down um, so they're safe, uh, as in they operate properly, then that's great. Just noted then that the clock appears to have a new escapement or a new escape wheel um, of larger diameter than the original, which again is not unusual. And I keep coming back to this uh, weight that's added on this quarter rack hook. I think um, that, uh, as I said, that's going to be somewhere where we're really going to concentrate and try and get that sorted out. So I continue to run through the striking sequence, again figuring out really a plan or an approach to um, to the work given that we have multiple and overlapping issues here as we often do with the clock of this age. So I remove the uh, quarter striking bells, get them out of the way. They all seem to be fine so they're safest uh, packed away. And that gives us access to see our quarter striking train a bit more closely. And yeah, as I suspected, this uh, fly or air brake device has had quite a lot of attention and um, it has an additional little spring and it has these little bits uh, added to and some weights. So yeah, we're going to um, do a whole uh, intervention on this. Notice it, I notice at the same time that the pallet arbor there, part of the escapement, is discoloured um, through heating. So again, we will investigate that as we go along. You can see here the hour striking hammer shank. Uh, typically, when the clock would be new, you might expect that hammer shank to be vertical where the, the boss is. And you can see it's leaning across, which means the hammer head has been bent back. And I think all this is, is the bearings are worn. So um, that'll be an early, as I said, that'll be an early and relatively easy win to tidy that up, maybe to put some new bearings in, which will dampen down the action and prevent it from rattling such a lot. Yeah, I'm pretty obsessed by this. <laughs> this component, I keep coming back to it and thinking about what I'm going to do. Of course, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, uh, should I be replacing the fly uh, vane in its entirety or should I actually try and repair it? But that's a bit further down the, down the road. So the clock has uh, bronze lines which are a wire rope line. I'm going to start the under dial work disassembly. So that's all the work that sits between the front of the clock movement and the back of the clock dial. So to release our hour pipe on which the hour hand fits, we need to remove this little bracket which is called the minute wheel cock. And I notice that the minute wheel cock is pretty unstable. Most, clock, most components on a clock of this age are what we call steady pinned. So they're actually located in place by little uh, steel pins and you can see on the back of this component it has those pins but for some reason either the pins have been filed down or the holes in which they sit have been opened up and so it's uh, unstable which is not good and you can also see that the screw has got flats on it, the screw thread where it's been uh, forged on a block or trapped in a vice or something so either it's not, although it's an 18th century screw by the look of it either it's not the right screw for the hole or uh, the thread has just gotten worn and somebody's just sort of squidged it out a bit to, to make it hold which is a typical kind of intervention you can you see. So removing our, our um, wheel and our wheel pipe this is a nice component because it contains a clutch which allows the um, our, our hand to be set in theory at least independently of the minute hand. Um, what's happened here though is that it appears that the uh, assembly hasn't been taken apart for some time um, and we can see that the little pin that holds it together is actually riveted over. 
So it's really useful if you carry out repairs to a clock like this to leave that pin long. It doesn't need riveting and it means it can, the component can be easily taken apart for cleaning and you can see although the clock is clean this particular part hasn't been disassembled so I will be removing that pin and replacing it with one that can be more easily uh, removed by the next person. I noticed this wheel has got one let-in tooth which is uh, not uncommon for clocks of this this age. So with our hour wheel removed we can remove our quarter uh, cam and minute wheel so this wheel uh, forms part of the 12 to 1 gearing between the minute hand and the hour hand and as soon as I lift the wheel away I can see that the pins on the back have been touching the plate uh, which is unnecessary friction so I know that when I stabilize that minute wheel cock then um, we're going to get around that problem which is um, a step forward in its own right now interestingly both this quarter counting cam and the hour cam or snail have got these deep grooves uh, cut into them which has been done not through wear but by either a, a repairer or by the maker for when the clock runs in uh, kind of safety mode if there's a problem with the striking. So here are our four pins for um, releasing the quarter striking. And you can see that the pins that hold the wheel to the cam have been changed and they're kind of riveted over, they're relatively modern. So I guess the relationship between these two components has been changed. Both the wheel and the cam look to be original, as far as I can see anyway. And there's been some difference of opinion about the relative, um, the kind of phase relationship of this wheel with the cannon wheel with which it engages, which is again very common for uh, older clocks. Now to let the power off the mainspring, sometimes there is a little hole which you can access the ratchet between the great wheel teeth that we just saw, but in this case they don't seem to be drilled, so I'll have to uh, let the power down in a more long-winded way. So we're just gonna tie up the escape wheel for the time being, I don't want it whizzing round as soon as I uh, take the pallets out. So let's uh, remove the, uh, the bracket that holds the um, pallets in place which is called the back cock as you can see it's uh, has two screws I'm not particularly uh, worried about um, mixing these screws up at the moment um, given that they are probably maybe not in the original holes who knows but I'll spend some time later on uh, trying to figure out which one goes where. So lifting our pallets out, as I said um, they've been uh, relatively recently heated and I thought it was to um, put new faces on them. The one on the right here, the exit pallet is cracked um, but it's not uh, impinging on the working surface so I'm not too worried about that. And I realised, in fact, that the heated part, the bit you can see that's coloured here, is because the pallets have been moved along their arbour. The boss on which they fit is soft-soldered. So they've been moved to operate on a different part of the um, escapement. And they've also been refinished, as you can see here, by this kind of rounding of the surfaces. So um, maybe they will need refacing, uh, but although this might be considered... Um, not so attractive this discoloration actually it isn't massively on my radar at the moment you can see here a little bit of soft solder where the pallets have been slid along the rubber so that kind of uh, puts it in my mind why they've been heated you can see a bit of wear on the pallet faces there but uh, nothing that um, 
really stands in our way of getting the clock running, at least in the first instance. So looking at the, uh, the back cock, when we uh, look on the inside, we can see that there are two bearing holes, um, which ties in with the fact that the clock appears to have had a new escape wheel, the second one being significantly larger diameter than the first. And again, this is pretty typical for uh, a clock of this period to have had at least one new escapement, if not, uh, if not two. Some clocks, uh, maybe a bit earlier than this, originally had a verge escapement, so a completely different kind of escapement. This one, I think, has always been anchor recoil. So, no surprises here. What is later are these pins that are in the back plate. Uh, they I, are, I think, an attempt at some kind of banking pins to protect the escapement. When we look at the escape wheel, we can see it has new teeth. Um, anyway, I took those out. So the next component on our list is the hour striking rack and the thing I noticed here is that the rack spring is set quite strong. Now the, this has knock-on implications, it means that the hour striking train has to do more work than is necessary to gather in the rack and secondly as the rack what we call drops it, uh, if the spring's too strong it can actually fracture the rivet between the rack arm and the rack itself so it's useful again to adjust those springs so they're uh, obviously functioning but kind of only just and then um, then you know that no additional wear is taking place that's unnecessary now this is all rather uh, easier said than done of course because um, when you're trying to fix the thing there's a whole balancing act between all these components um, you can see this has been scratched with the word strike I think um, anyway and then the pin on the back is later you can see the riveting there but otherwise I think this components pretty um, pretty intact just saw there the nose of the rack has been filed with a bevel and that's typically because the um, bearing on which, on which it sits wears and the rack begins to catch on the edge of the plate but I don't know in this case. This component is called the jumper and it indexes the hour striking snail. A lot of uh, terminology here and apologies for that but you can see that it's got its original casting uh, mark on the back uh, which is exactly what you want to see so really nice uh, a little bit warm but absolutely uh, absolutely fine don't need to do anything with that other than clean it this is a brass on brass bearing so when we lubricate it maybe uh, I'll use something like a bit of graphite rather than um, oil as such to prevent it from sticking now remove the uh, start. We now remove the snail, our striking snail, which is a cam that controls the number of blows struck, which in this case is fitted to a star wheel uh, for the for its indexing. And again, uh, everything here seems okay. Got some nice original turning marks on the back, and then these um, again this deep groove. Um, that's been cut for um, when the clock is in uh, safety, as in if for some reason the striking train fails, the clock continues to run. I've never seen that before cut quite in that way, but it makes, um, it makes sense, I guess. It doesn't look like new work. So uh, thinking back to our hand collet, I'm figuring out how strong the clutch spring is between the movement and the minute hand. Uh, this is often a problem. Uh, this wheel, uh, called the cannon wheel, has got a little pin on it which does indexing and um, if that spring isn't compressed enough then it touches on the back of this bridge that you can see. So when we take the bridge off it'll be interesting to see whether that pin has been rubbing because what that can cause is an intermediate fault uh, if it just touches but not enough to stop the clock. So. Again, what we're seeing here, as I presumed, is not just one single issue here, but multiple overlapping and interconnected 
uh, issues that uh, sort of compound really to really give you a problem. So yeah, there are some marks there. Um, it's difficult to tell whether the filing here on the back is new um, or whether it was done a long time ago, again, because the clock has been uh, refinished. Um, new marks and old marks are often very difficult to tell apart. But yeah, the pin has been touching the, the back of the bridge here. So um, that at some point uh, in the history of the clock has given somebody a bit of a problem. So it's well worth looking out for again if you're repairing a clock with that striking system then to make sure that that's the spring we're going to see in a couple of minutes is properly compressed otherwise this can really give you a, a headache it's almost impossible to see once the clock is uh, assembled so here's our cannon pipe on which the minute wheel fits sorry on which the minute hand fits and uh, again everything looks cool here no Latin teeth just the one little pin that does the indexing uh, all, all really nice 18th century work. There's been a bit of confusion there about where exactly this wheel fits in relation to the wheel that uh, drives it, or that it drives, sorry. And then if we look at the open end of the pipe, we can see this file mark and a little notch in the square. Uh, I think one of those, if not both of them, are manufacturer's marks to indicate the orientation of the minute hand so when you reassemble the clock you don't have to try the hand in different positions. So this component called the bow or boat spring for obvious reasons kind of causes more problems <laughs> than almost anything else uh, considering that it's so sort of um, small and simple. It has these hammer marks which is uh, which is okay it's hammer hardened brass but um, as much as this one is tapered in width, ideally it would be tapered in thickness as well to give it compliance. However, I'm not sure that it needs thinning out. You could flatten it and file it and reshape it again. It's not difficult. But um, it may be that once that hand collet situation is resolved, then this will be compressed enough to allow the little pin that we saw to clear the hour wheel bridge. Next we'll remove this trip repeating lever. Now I think this originally was there to synchronize the quarter um, striking barrel so you can have the correct run of the bells at quarter past and it's sort of been adapted I think to also release the hour striking. I don't know enough about the history of these clocks to know whether it's been changed but when I lift it off I can feel that it jams, which tells me there's a burr there on the stud. Now that is a tiny thing, but again, that can cause, maybe not in the case of this component, but it can cause you a real problem because it's very, very difficult to see. So this is our flirt uh, mechanism, this weight, which releases the striking and the spring that operates it. And I can see by the shape of the spring and a later pin, in fact, the Blurt, the steel bit is banking against the pin which I'm 90% convinced is a, a later addition uh, doesn't need to be there shouldn't be there and that's probably causing uh, it means that the spring has to be set stronger um, than it would normally which means that the going train the time has to do more work uh, which means that maybe the clock is stopping with all the other things we've seen so yeah this will be somewhere where I'm spending quite a lot of time in figuring out what's the best way to get this running as uh, good as I can uh, given the fact that um, we don't really want to be making new components if we can help it we want to try and preserve what's there so on the back of the uh, flirt or on the um, arm or lever that activates it we can see that uh, it has been filed to make it shorter uh, the brass bit which is again totally kind of normal you see this a lot and it's also been hammered to make it longer so uh, over the years decades and centuries in this case people have um, uh, tried to get the striking to release 
at the exact time of the hour or the quarters and that's where you see these marks here again it's it's quite unusual to see a clock that doesn't have these kinds of um, these kinds of alterations that's 200 years old otherwise the flirt seems in good condition so this is the our rack the part of the our striking mechanism which I'm going to remove and you can see that this is held out of the way by the quarter rack um, which is activated by that quarter rack spring so the again these things all interconnect now what um, interests me here is this pin that's sticking out I think this is later this is so the striking train can be repeated by pulling on that lever but you can see the pin is sticking up at an angle which is just kind of not uh, typical of 18th century work it would have been made in a in a different way I think so that's not a reason to that's not a reason to take it off it's just a reason to be aware that when it comes to reassembly and testing that this might actually cause us a, a bit of a problem the customer mentioned that when the clock was repeated sometimes it would jam and it would just continue striking without relocking so um, again all these things are on my mind so this device um, is the our striking piece our striking warning piece and this locks the our striking train until the quarter striking train has done its work so you get things in the right sequence and again as you can see it's just two components but the pin between the two has been replaced which is kind of quite interesting because um, normally this is pretty robust and not really subject to uh, to much alteration so it's difficult to imagine why that would have been done but again as we dig into the uh, sort of archaeological layers of an object like this um, some things seem quite obvious and others remain a bit of a mystery. Um, those overlapping layers are very, very difficult to sort of interpret, really. So our quarter rack, so this is part of the quarter striking mechanism. And again, what concerns me here is the strength of that spring. I think it's set quite strong. And um, yes, it has work to do, but again, if you can... Um, work the trick of setting it so it just does enough safely then that's really great because the quarter striking train doesn't have to do extra or additional work which all adds up to more wear so again the component looks in good condition again, it's been scratched um, quarter maybe can't remember and then interestingly the arm has bent in but it has to be given the, rec the current configuration of the clock so either the pipe that's between these two uh, the steel bit and the brass bit is later or it's always been like that it, again difficult to um, consider how it's changed and I noticed the pin on the back of the rack here is actually now a little stud and it's later but I couldn't see what harm it was doing right until the end of this project and I realized there was an intermittent problem with the quarter striking train and very occasionally on the quarter the little pallet that you can see rotating now was catching on that stud and um, and stalling the train this is the quarter rack hook latch and this makes sure that when the quarter train runs um, the correct number of blows are struck uh, and so it's an important little device and you can see it's been bent a little bit at the top but overall in reasonably good shape uh, but my concern here is that the spring that operates it is later it's too strong and it touches the component too far away from the pivot which reduces its ability to be snappy the whole point of this device that element the whole point of that component is it's got a very snappy action so this is the hook for the quarter rack that we've just seen being removed and uh, just testing its action on the stud. It's either worn or there's a new bearing here which um, is 
a little bit sloppy and again these things all add up so um, the pin on the back which interacts with the latch looks okay and the gathering pallet is tight no pin on these are just driven onto their squares so here's the rack hook for the quarters and it has this additional circular weight thing that you can see on the left which is held on with uh, modern adhesive so I think oh given the other interventions we're going to have to uh, carry out we can probably just take that weight off and discount it the pin for the latch has been moved at some time but it looks like it was a long time ago um, so I'm not too worried about that but yeah this weight uh, not quite sure why it was added um, it may remain a mystery but anyway we'll probably remove that and uh, tidy it up a little bit because we can't um, release the mainspring um, we need to just let the trains run so I put a bit of oil on the bearings although it's, the clock is quite oily and I noticed that on the quarter striking train the one you can see running now the fly the air brake if you like at the top it's making a kind of unusual noise and we can see this sort of vibrating action which isn't unusual for a striking train fly but it is noisy the added weights don't help but I wonder whether the bearing hole is worn or there's an issue with the pivot we won't know until we've taken it apart you can just about see there that at some point the spring for the fly has been moved and that, I think, is because the escape wheel was made larger and it had to be shifted across as the fly was cut away. So lots to think about and we're only just kind of beginning to scratch the surface of, um, of what this clock has in place for us. So pack, out, pack those components away for the time being and on to the next stage. So these uh, studs on the front plate so this clock has got three different kinds of studs, which is a bit unusual. Uh, there's the all steel ones. There's ones like this that are steel with a brass uh, boss at the bottom or square, which look perfectly fine to me. I don't quite know why they're like that. Maybe they're 19th century um, alterations. This one is a typical example where um, the thread is pretty worn and again it's been squashed in the vice or between a pair of pliers or something um, which doesn't massively bother me obviously if the thread's completely stripped then you have to do something about it but I think um, when you clean this it's going to be uh, tight enough and there's always the option as controversial as it is to use modern adhesives like thread lockers and things like that on uh, something that's, um, if it were to fail, it's not catastrophic, not massively interested in sort of rebuilding everything. So here is our flirt spring. So this is the, the spring that um, energises the device that releases the striking. Uh, it's touching the plate, which is not great, and it's adjusting. And of course, over the years, this spring is so critical to the operation of the clock, it's been bent uh, every which way, um, which is not, not a surprise again. But the screw was loose, which wouldn't be helping the amount of kind of tension that it's got. And that pin that we see there driven into the plate, that one, is, um, I think, again later. So I'll consider... Um, I'll consider removing that and again this component which is a spring for the trip repeating is um, probably a whole later spring but that was loose as well so uh, again with these historic threads it's really difficult to get them tight enough so the clock doesn't fall apart but um, uh, not too tight that you actually damage the threads of course the hundreds and hundreds of times that these screws are taken out eventually the threads wear and you have to make a decision as to what you're going to do about that. Again, that one had been squashed a bit to make it bite in the hole. So here's a rack of hammers and uh, looks fine. We can see the manufacturer's uh, marks that they put on to number them. So when you take it apart, you can easily get them back in the right order. One through eight. Uh, we've got a later 
spring which is screwed onto the frame which is fine uh, legitimate repair you might say and then another repair to this hammer shank on the right here this one which has got a little brass tube on it which is not massively uh, attractive maybe but it's if it's sound then given all the other work we've got to do on this clock that'll be a pretty low priority to um, to replace that again I'd kind of class that broadly as a legitimate repair maybe not super tidy but it's um, for now it's fine so this part of the mechanism I gathered from the get-go uh, was something that would need quite a bit of investigation so these marks that you see here, these punch marks, are modern. I mean, they could be 19th century, I think the 20th century, who knows. But they don't agree. We've got threes and twos together and twos and ones together. So it's pretty obvious here that things are mixed up. And not that this would necessarily cause a problem with the clock running, but it would certainly be kind of nice to investigate how it might have been when it was first made because components like this are often marked by the maker so we just have to figure out which one goes with which certainly no need whatsoever to punch the the components when you see the original marks you can see that they're a very different nature to these um, these punched dots so the next thing to do is to let off a preload although this clock has now run down um, the springs have still got a little bit of preload on them. Sometimes people count uh, how much preload there is. That turning of the ratchet was due to the uh, wire rope lines. And there we have it again. Um, but we're into such kind of deep water here with this clock that we're just going to start from scratch. So I don't need to worry too much about um, how much preload there is. Uh, I did notice, though, that the going tray in the middle one of these ratchets had virtually no preload on it, and I suspect that spring is new and is overdriving the clock. So let's just strip these components off, and then we can come back to it with a fresh uh, eye, if you like, and try and figure out which one goes with which and which barrel goes in there in which hole. In fact, there, there are three main spring barrels here. The two on the left are similar. The one on the right we don't have a problem with because it's much larger for the striking train, so quarter striking. So let's lift off these uh, ratchets, set up ratchets, and I can see underneath they have uh, manufacturer's dot marks as I suspected they might. So again, if you're repairing a clock like this, it's really so unusual to have to mark anything um, it's, it's just not necessary so we'll just remove these uh, these taper pins these pins don't do a whole lot of work once the clock is set up and running these ratchets aren't adjusted uh, they're just set by the clockmaker. now this is interesting because um, you wouldn't expect this component to be jammed on which is why I think it's probably on the wrong square or in the wrong orientation we'll see so I just try and lever it up with a bit of pegwood but it's pretty jammed on there so we're gonna have to um, lever it from both sides I think in order to get it off so I just protect the plate with a bit of thin card which is useful to have lying around sharpening my pegwood in the background <laughs> so we've got two wedges here of wood and we're just gonna lift the uh, component away it's worth I think just taking that bit more time there we go so no problem there you can see the end of the barrel arbor is also um, punch marked which I think is uh, later as well there are the two dot marks by the maker as people um, repair these clocks obviously the attitude towards them changes and fashion changes the value of the clock changes and so there's a whole set of philosophies in terms of what people think is the right thing to do in terms of repair so uh, I think from my perspective all I can do is really observe and communicate um, what I see and that's about it really um, I know that um, these things are often quite controversial but the reality is uh, that the repairs and changes that have been carried out are done so I think uh, just a discussion or dialogue 
about ways forward is always um, incredibly useful. So the clock has got six frame pillars, these uh, just knocking out these six pins. And again, protecting the plate with a little bit of um, thin card. I tried to knock that one in the wrong direction, which doesn't help. out so there's um the frame it, in a way is kind of quite organic these uh, cast plates are hand scraped and then filed and finished um, so of course the movement is beautifully made uh, but again in part due to the 100 200 years or so that have uh, elapsed since the clock was made there are all sorts of changes and movements. And when we look at the inside of the plate, you can see the surface is not uh, at all sort of overall uh, flat. It's um, changed quite a bit over the years. Nevertheless, the plate and the frame should sit together um, quite easily. And in this case, they do. Um, there's no major overall distortion of the, of the frame, which is really good news. So now we have our six pins out we should just be able to lift away the plate so as we lift away the plate one of the um, fusey uh, stop pieces has got caught inside the stop high end so I have to rotate it a bit to liberate it but there we are, the plate is uh, the plate is off. And I see straight away that the end of the bronze lines has been rubbing on the inside of the plate. Uh, you will gather I'm not a major fan of these lines. Um, uh, that's another story really, but as I said, I'm going to replace them with natural gut. And yeah, you can see these round marks where the, the line has been rubbing. But more worryingly, um, yeah, and the plate has been extensively refinished as well, which is why you can see this sort of a rounding near the holes. Um, but anyway, so more worryingly, these three devices here are the fusee stop irons. So they uh, stop the clock being overwound, if you like. And we can see that the middle one is really loose. So in fact, the, the fact that we got to work on this clock now is really useful. Just resolving this issue alone could um, save a lot of problems in future. Because if that stop iron fails and the uh, line breaks, uh, for instance, or there's um, some issue, all the energy in the spring can be released in an instant. Uh, that's a bit of a disaster scenario. But nevertheless, you of all the components in the clock, the winding ratchets really and these stop irons, you want them to be really well secured. So you can see this one's loose. Um, it's meant to have the spring under there, which pops it out. But um, the, yeah, the whole thing's loose. And when we flip the plate over, we can see that the pin uh, is loose there. And had that fallen out and the clock been wound, yeah, there would have been um, a bit of a problem. So glad we spotted that. So here are our three trains and um, it's a good opportunity to take some photographs if you're not confident of where they go because this clock is handmade nothing really can be interchanged just notice that third wheel there um, finished very differently so that's something I'm going to want to investigate it always sort of worries me when I see that uh, uh, sort of annular refinishing of the entire mobile it's um, anyway we'll see as we go along so it's time really just to lift these components out. I don't think there's much else to be learned here. I'm just going to snip off these lines, get them out of the way. We don't need those anymore. The parts I remove, um, although there won't be many, I always return to the, the client, including these um, lines. You can find a link uh, below to the brand of gut lines I use on a clock like this. And... Um, yeah, as I said, a synthetic uh, gut is uh, useful too. I personally prefer the natural stuff, but p personal choice. So let's look at these barrels. Um, 
Again, totally typical of a clock of this age. You see multiple different marks indicating whether they're for W, which is watch, or winding, or going train, S for striking, and then the quarter train, as I said, is can't get it mixed up with the other two because it's a, a totally different size. But to a degree, these could be mixed up, and I'm becoming increasingly convinced that despite all these later marks, they are in fact, um, they're mixed round. I think what's happened, and uh, for whatever reason, is this barrel, which has got the W1 for watch by the maker on the barrel cap and on the barrel body, was in the striking train. And we noticed that the striking train was running slow. A little crack in the barrel as well, I noticed. Um, so I think um, that, yeah, for, for some reason these have got mixed round. It has got an S scratched on it, but it's late, so you can kind of discount that. Really, doesn't mean a doesn't mean a whole uh, deal, I'm afraid. It'll be interesting to see when we get the barrel cap off whether the barrel arbor is in fact the one for the uh, watch or going train. Yeah, multiple conflicting um, marks. So. These marks here on the winding square, I think, are made by the maker, and they probably uh, tie in with the um, the dots on the inside of the winding ratchets. So I think this is the correct arbor with the correct barrel, but it was just in the wrong place. So this will therefore be the striking train. Yeah, it has one uh, a mark struck across it with a file, and although it has two Ws and a G and other things on it, we can pretty much totally ignore that. I think this is, uh, in fact, the striking barrel. So there are our three barrels with the quad striking on the right. As I said, we're, oh, that one's got some rusty oil dripping out of it. Um, but we can get rid of that because it's it's not a problem. If the other two are resolved, then that one automatically falls into place, if you like. So yeah, I think that's the way around they should be in the in the train, with the W barrel in the centre. So let's just um, get the barrel cap off and have a look at that arbour. So here we have what we believe is our winding or going barrel and let's just pop the cap off and see what the barrel arbor looks like. The arbor is the axle on which the about which the barrel rotates and when we pop it out we can see straight away that in fact um, has the same mark and I believe that's an original mark. So yeah, the, as, I, as I thought, um, this is perfectly fine. And it also looks like an old spring, which is really great. It looks like a maybe 19th century spring. So it'd be really cool if we could, um, re, uh, we, we could re retain that really nice. So that means that um, when we put the, winding, the setup ratchets on, two dots with two marks fits really well. one mark, one file mark and one dot align those two fits really well and so the third one must fit as well. So that's great, that in its own right if, um, I think is really satisfying to get that sorted out. So time to remove our train. We can lift the wheels out in kind of what order we want really. I also noticed that the pinwheel on the left here has got marks on its face where the hammer tail has been rubbing. So again, we will address that uh, pretty early on. Now, um, what I do next is to put all the wheels back in the frame in pairs to check their meshing. If um, the bearings are worn, then uh, it can be that the depthing or the meshing can be improved by a process called bushing. However, there's actually, I think, very little bushing to be done here. There's been lots of it done already. But I'm going to check the mobiles in pairs anyway. 
Uh, first I do them uh, like this by hand, so I apply a bit of friction uh, to the, our resistance to the driven mobile and then push the mobiles apart and push them back together and uh, to try and kind of determine whether changing the centre distance, how far apart they are, will actually improve or um, uh, make meshing worse transfer of power. So here we have a, a great wheel driving um, an intermediate pinion or maybe the pinwheel pinion, I can't remember. And um, we, we can do this by feel or we can do this by putting the wheels in a, a tool called the depthing tool which we'll look at in a moment. This is also useful for checking things like bent teeth and bent arbors and bent pivots if you actually look at the wheels in, um, in pairs. So again this is the uh, third wheel or upper intermediate wheel on the going side, the one that we just saw had been refinished and you can see it doesn't line up with the track of one pinion leaf and um, so I'll probably move that back. Somebody's moved it because they thought the pinion was worn but um, the problem with doing that is that this wheel, the brass one we see here, is no longer concentric or flat and I tested it and thought it was probably okay and borderline but actually when I came to get the clock on test um, I found that it was stopping the clock so you can see it wobbling about there. So in fact I did have to go back and remount that wheel and um, get it concentric again. So um, you see I'm spinning the wheels there and the wheels seem to run fine. Unfortunately, as much as it feels really nice, spinning the wheels really very rarely gets you anywhere. You have to test them like this under load. And um, if you think that the mesh is uneven, then or jamming at all then it's best to take the wheels out and put them in the depthing tool. So looking at that third wheel I can see that there's um, a let in tooth here which is actually fine. In fact there are two let in tooth teeth. This one has been dovetailed in and done quite neatly. The other one not so neatly but again it doesn't bother me if the depthing is fine. Um, the wheel has been refinished, which is a bit of a shame, but um, that's kind of 20th century uh, practice, I suppose, and uh, it's, it's, it's okay. So this is the depthing tool. So if we have any uh, suspicion about the mesh of any two mobiles, we can use this to try and determine the optimal centre distance, compare that with what's on the actual clock, and then make a decision whether that bearing um, needs to be moved. Uh, in order to make the clock run. So I set the escape wheel and that uh, upper intermediate wheel in the tool and then I change the distance between those two mobiles until I get what I think is an optimal uh, centre distance. And I was slightly off track here. As I said, it wasn't the fact that the centre distance was particularly bad. It was the fact that the third wheel, the one on the closest to the camera here, was had been moved and was now eccentric. So um, it did actually cause the clock to stop because we managed to retain that uh, old mainspring. So it's not massively overdriven. So you can see the eccentricity here. It doesn't look a great deal, but again, these kind of marginal issues, um, they, they add up. I thought this was fine, and um, as I said, when it came to it, it wasn't. So just testing the, uh, the difference or the gap with the feeler gauge there. So that's about it uh, for this uh, part of the disassembly. We're going to uh, launch straight into our next video, which will be one of those interventions or repairs. Thank you and bye for now.